Good afternoon. Thank you for skipping your lunch and being here. We'll make this a very short session. Uh, it's actually um, uh, an interesting sequel to our session on immigrants and immigration yesterday. And today we do a full-blown highlight of this book, which is called Those Immigrants. And this is by Dr. Scott Haas, who is a clinical psychologist. Uh, I should begin by thanking everybody, not only here, but the organizers, JLF, Colorado Hosts, and Teamworks. Um, this book says, those immigrants, a psychological exploration of achievement. Um, and one of the statements that uh, Scott has, um, that caught my, caught my attention uh, that, that Scott has makes is, immigrants keep societies from stagnating. So I should say uh, in the introduction that uh, Dr. Scott Haas is a clinical psychologist uh, based in Cambridge, Massachusetts. He's the author of Hearing Voices, Reflections of a Psychology Intern, Are We There Yet? And Back of the House. Uh, he has also um, written um, frequently in the Boston Globe, USA Today, and so on and so forth. Um, he has been a participant in a nationally syndicated show on National Public Radio. His PhD is from the University of Detroit, and he did his doctoral internship in Massachusetts Mental Health Center, a Harvard Medical uh, and Teaching Hospital. So he is not a sociologist, and he's writing about a segment of Indian, uh, a segment of multicultural America, which is the Indian American population. So I found this statement very powerful, which is immigrants keep societies from stagnating because we are speaking here at a time when there is so much anti-immigrant rhetoric. Um, and um, how, you know, it's important to think how we juxtapose this in terms of the kind of um, political rhetoric that we are hearing today in US politics. Now the cover of this book has a lady of liberty draped in a sari. And it's a red sari, uh, symbolically happy, auspicious, victorious. Those are the colors that I would associate with that. And the foreword to the book is written by Ami Bera, who was elected to the Congress in, uh, to the US Congress in 2012, 2013. And he's a son of Indian immigrants um, who came several years ago. So among the things that, um, that uh, Scott has talks about in the 30 profiles that he uh, chooses of Indian Americans is that in a very short spirit, a period of time um, and in the range of professions that these Indian Americans are in, uh, they have really excelled and become great achievers. And he chooses profiles from, from Wall Street, from the world of medicine, from Ivy League universities, from the performing arts, from nonprofits, from media, um, and several other professions. So uh, he, among the, among the qualities that he concludes are important for this are resilience and versatility. And I won't mention the others because you have to read the book for that. So my first question to Scott is, um, you're a clinical psychologist. Uh, in Massachusetts, uh, that's not the area for the largest Indian American population because those are California and New Jersey. Uh, so. What in your personal experience prompted you to do this work on Indian Americans? And how did you choose these 30 people? So first, thank you for taking the time to meet with me. And thanks, everyone, for coming here. Um, when you start a book, it's not always clear what the book's going to be. So I started the book about five years ago. And I, had, I was in India. And I was walking around with my wife and kids. We rented a house in the south. And two things prompted the original idea. One was. Everywhere I went, and this was in Kerala, but even in the north where he rented a house in Himachal Pradesh once, um, a lot of people were reading newspapers. And I was really struck by the fact that people want to be informed. And the second thing that struck me was, no matter where I went, whether it was a grocery store or you know, at a train station, and I would offer an opinion about something, the person felt that they had enough social authority to contradict me. And there were a lot of opinions. And I really welcomed this. I found this fascinating. So what I wanted to write about was the, the depth of versatility in the population. I work in Boston where, despite the fact that it's not um, an epicenter, let's say, or a center of Indian life, we have a lot of universities. And I work in a lot of hospitals. And each year, I saw more and more colleagues who were from India. And I was kind of 
disturbed by the, um, the stereotypes of say, so-called tiger mothers or genetic superiority, neither of which seem to be true. And I thought as a psychologist, I might be able to understand better um, what are the components of success and what are some of the components of challenges and how those challenges are overcome. As the book progressed on a personal level, it occurred to me, huh, I grew up in an immigrant household. My father came to the United States in August of 1941 from Bavaria. And so that probably had something to do with the choice of topic, but it was not evident to me when I first started it. Um, these are people who, and I saw their pictures and their stories about their lives. And um, so they're all hanging around and they did share some personal stories. Um, something about authorial freedom. Did you have the choice of just writing it up, publishing it? Did they want to see the stuff? What were the... So a lot of these, I, I am only good at really two things. And just to be clear about this, we had a stove in our house where the alarm was going off. And it just kept going off. And I kept fixing it. And finally, one night, I took a hammer and smashed it. And my wife said, well, why did you smash the?" I said, well, the alarm, it just stopped ringing. So, but I'm good at two things. And one is I'm good at observing and documenting. And I write down, I wrote down everything that people said to me. At the same time, I make a lot of mistakes. And so I would send back the interviews to all 30 people. And I said, do not correct this for narrative. Do not change what I wrote. But um, if I said that you went to school at St. Peter's and uh -huh. it was St. Paul's, that needs to be corrected. It only happened one, two individuals got upset. And we, we settled it. One individual was upset because she thought I emphasized her Tommy O'Brien background, which I didn't because that's what she spoke about. And we became good friends after that. And the second one um, had to do with the fact that one of the individuals had a spouse who, in his high school years, smoked a lot of pot. She said, I don't have a problem with it. His family doesn't have a problem with it. But maybe you should take that out. And I, I, out of respect for the family, I thought, well, that's fine. That is so interesting, because you're actually um, offering me a space to bring up something else, which is that those of us who know uh, Indian diaspora communities, we would know that there would be some hesitations in speaking about really personal issues. Maybe there were issues that are to do with family life, with, to do with sexuality, to do with bad marriages, and so on and so forth, or uh, kids um, and their choices in sexuality. So I was really wondering, uh, were you conscious of your clinical psychologist hat when you were doing this? The book didn't give me the impression that people were very forthcoming about saying, you know, my nephew is a homosexual, or that's something else like it. I don't believe that all of those people live those really sanitized lives where there was nothing of domestic abuse or anything. So did you feel that there was this sort of nice, sweet, let's not talk about that? So that will be the next book because, <laughs> because I don't think people left anything out. But when I did a presentation of this book at this Congress called India Diaspora, which is an annual event in Philadelphia, two of the individuals in the audience who were Indian Americans got really upset with me. And they said, where's the domestic abuse? Where, and these were men. Where, I was there. Oh, you were there. Yeah. OK. So where, where's, where, where are the stories of like how difficult it was to grow up with you know, a father who was very demanding? And I said, that will be the next book. I didn't take anything out. And it, I think that people understood that I wanted to tell success stories. Um, and so right. not that one's gender identity or whatever is a any barrier necessarily to sex, but people understood that I was there to really address a few things, which was what got in your way, uh -huh. what helped you overcome that, what are some ongoing struggles, and, and what might you as an individual have to say to younger Indians planning to come here who have just gotten here? But I didn't, I didn't not ask it, yeah. So there are remarkable stories that, that I highly recommend that you should read, but you know, the conversation needs another footnote before we end this, which is exactly where you were raising this about the questions that people would have asked. And I want to add a few remarks here about the Indian American community, which I have been researching and teaching about at the American University in Washington, DC, that uh, there are three, three point, estimated 3.2 million Indian Americans, not South Asian, Indian Americans in this country. The two states with the largest concentration are California and uh, New Jersey. Uh, the 1965 Nationality Act is what led to a whole wave of Indian Americans who, of Indians who migrated to America, who were typically people with degrees and so on and so forth. But that's not the first time Indians came to this country. They actually came uh, to California as soldiers during the World War, or they came as farmers, and many of them were Sikh farmers. And today, many of them in the, in the Central Valley in California are owners of great uh, fruit and agricultural um, 
businesses. In fact, they say the okra king is an Indian and the peach king is an Indian and so on and so forth. So there is a more complex story there. There are also in this number of 3.2, there are 100,000 Indian students included. Those Indian students are actually not Indian American. They are from India and they are fee paying students in this country. So you can imagine that's the contribution of Indian money to the US economy. So that's something else that's going on, even when the conversations go on about the jobs that are going away or something else. Now, there are several organizations within the community here which look at issues of domestic violence. There are issues of sexuality which are coming up and difficult choices that, that people are making to break the news of their sexual choices to their families, and I've had Indian American students who've had long conversations with me about these things. So we know that all of that is going on like in any other community. So while we do have stories here of remarkable success, that is a slice, a wonderful slice Absolutely. of the Indian American Absolutely. community. And we're waiting for a second book that Scott are. might write or I might write. Perfect. <laughs> and so there are issues of gender. And um, you know, I saw a line in, in the foreword, which is done by Ami Bera. And he says, quote, after all, we are the land of opportunity, un unquote. Now, this book really chronicles the stories of remarkable Indian Americans, and Ami Bera is talking about that, but he and everybody else in the community knows that are not just remarkable stories and not just stories of remarkable people. That among the statistics is also the fact that among the uh, fastest growing numbers of undocumented people are South Asians. So there are you know, there are, there are people at Harvard and there are people who are medical doctors, but there are also cab drivers. There are also ghettos where people have not been able to get out of their, their, um, their um, economic hardships for a very, very long time. Um, were there any, beyond these, uh, these sort of successes in different fields, are there psychological insights that you might want to just as a passing shot before sure, we Sure, sure, sure. And I, one of the things I think that's important to remember and what I wanted to establish is that it's not genetics and it's not tiger mothers. There's some real things that are going on, like mentoring. A lot of the individuals I spoke to um, spoke about just their teenage kids, finding someone in their 30s and 40s who would say, here's how you prepare for an interview. Here's how you exit an interview. Um, there was a lot of talk about um, education being important. But the, the mentoring thing really blew my mind because um, I work a lot in uh, a community in, in Boston and I'm not from that community, but the mentoring that, that I do and other people do really resonates for people who are teenagers. And I think that's really important. I think all of us, at least I do, know a lot of people in their 20s who, are, who just don't understand how you can move forward vocationally. And in that, in the, among the individuals I met, that was in, of enormous importance. Thank you. And we have just a few minutes and I'd be happy to pick up questions here. We have, what, five minutes? Yes, so we can take three questions, we can take them all together so that Scott can answer. Yes, sir. Uh, don't you think uh, the deck is stacked because uh, a lot of the original Im Indian immigrants that came to this country came because they got their masters and PhD degrees and therefore they're gonna be successful? Well, okay, let's take, it. Let's take two or three oh, questions yeah, I apologize. together. Sure, sure, sure. So we just make sure just we remember, answer, yeah. okay. Yes, ma'am. Sorry, is that okay? Yeah, of course. All right. Did you have any fantasies or expectations that were shattered while writing that? Okay. Uh, one more question. Yes, ma'am. Is there a correlation between Indian immigrants as a whole and drug abuse as far as being low and high education? Okay. Do you so, have low so, so I have no idea. And, all right, so I don't know. Do you know? Oh, oh, maybe we'll just. All right. Okay. So it's absolutely the case that we were blessed in the 60s to f have um, an effort or not an effort. The, the laws changed. And so we were blessed to have the laws um, allow in, in individuals who were highly educated or were pursuing high degrees. We were blessed in two ways. One is they, these individuals added an enormous amount to this country. And the second thing is they created an infrastructure, and many people I interviewed spoke about that. There was an infrastructure for them to come here. I'm old enough to remember in the early 70s growing up in Plainfield, New Jersey, where I met the first person I met from India was a person who had been kicked out of Uganda when, they, when Idi Amin kicked out all the 
uh, South Asians. So, but the Indians who came over in the 80s and 90s didn't have that experience. There were grocery stores, there were, there were mosques, there were temples, and there was also a community of accept people. It wasn't that unusual to meet someone from India if you were in, in certain cities. So I think that that helped. It, I wouldn't say stack the deck, but it, it helped a lot to have that infrastructure. In Boston, we have that with the Irish American community. If you're, if you're Irish and you're coming over to Boston, it, it, it helps to have an Irish American community there that, that helps individuals. Um, in terms of fantasies, I don't know, it's a really interesting question. I, I don't really have fantasies about much of anything when I start a book. Um, I just try to be really patient and be really quiet in the sense that I try to get people to tell me their story and not insert my, I try not to have a narrative in mind. I try to have the narrative come to me. Um, it's when I start to intrude upon the narrative and start telling my story when the person's trying to tell me their story that that's where there's problems that arise. So I just try to listen. Perfect psychologist, right? Don't you? I don't know, but I mean, it's, it's, it's like, I don't, I'm not that interested in my own narrative. I just don't, I've gotten to the point in my life where I just don't, I don't, I'm not that interested in, in my story, so. <laughs> Ma'am, you had a question about the drugs. Um, so, um, we don't know of any rampant community-wide drug abuse, which is not to say there aren't pockets or individuals. Um, there may be pockets, but there is no uh, general anecdotal or data that supports that there is a lot of drug abuse, which continues there may be experimental stuff when people are in college or young or so on, but I don't know that there is large numbers of that. And maybe the support system that there is in the families to bring people up or bring them back into some mainstream or absorb them in family businesses, maybe all of those things help a little bit. So uh, may I just add a little bit to your, your question about uh, that it was all stacked because of the degrees. So I do want to say that not everybody had that. For example, Ami Bera, who is a congressman, I don't think his parents uh, came with, uh, with big fancy degrees. I should also speak about a segment of the Indian American population, which is in the hospitality industry. And many of them were Gujaratis, and you know now they say the Patel and the Motel are synonymous terms, because many of the motels, they say that 40% 40 40 of all hotel rooms in this country are owned by uh, uh, some Indian. Uh, they may not be at the front office, you won't see them, but they start small and they have family members who take up those and they get another mortgage and the carry on and keeps paying for itself. So that's a segment that we don't meet here, but that's an important segment too. Now, it's not necessary that they had the degrees, but their kids are all going to higher education. So I don't know that we can say that they all came with that. But I think education has been, as Scott says, education has been of tremendous importance. It's a huge priority, which is why the individuals in this book who've gone into the performing arts or become stand-up comics or something else, the dream of the parents was doctor, engineer, maybe lawyer, it's okay. But that was the ideal. So the ones who've done other things have had to negotiate that a little bit. It's changing hugely now, but that used to be pretty much the case, which yeah. is why one of the things that is often, often um, uh, spoken about is that are the Indian Americans the new Jews? That's one of the, one of the sort of... It, it's funny you mentioned the, the performing arts. One of the people I met who grew up in the Gulf, her father was an engineer, and she be went to Berkeley and became a jazz singer. And it was a real fight with the family. I said, well, how did you convince your dad to let you do that? And she said, I had to do a PowerPoint presentation. So she, <laughs> so she did it. And, like, and the dad came to the graduation. She showed me these beautiful pictures. I came, I found, you asked about how I found people. There was a, at, in Harvard Square, there's a place called the Beat Hotel. I saw a name look, that looked Indian, and I sent her an email, and she was nice enough to meet with me before the show. And she was just, she was so cool. So it, it, it can happen. So there are lots of young, cool Indian Americans. And on that note, I will say thank you to everyone, and we'll wind up. Thank Thanks you. again.